to do this uh, remote talk on behalf of the whole Chinese solar community. The topic of my talk is ground-based solar telescopes in China. Uh, it's, uh, it's a long talk uh, because we have many telescopes, including the optical telescope, infrared telescope, and also the radio telescope. So I wish I could yeah, uh, talk clear about the, uh, the situation, the state of these current facilities, and also uh, to introduce the uh, future plan of China. Okay, at first, uh, I would like to introduce the the current situation, the state of our one meter new vacuum solar telescope, uh, MVST. This is the telescope. You could see the the working mode of this telescope is uh, open air. This means we have no enclosure to protect the telescope when the telescope is working. So we need a very special device like this. We call this the wind screen to resist the wind. Okay, this telescope, the aperture of this telescope, the pure aperture of this telescope is one meter and the telescope is a vacuum telescope. This is the, the whole structure of the, of the building and the telescope. Uh, beyond the uh, telescope is a pool yeah, here uh, on the roof of our building uh, to cool the temperature and uh, to keep the, the quite good, uh, the excellent local scene. Under the telescope, there is a rotating platform. All the instrument, especially the MG instrument, uh, located on this uh, platform. Yeah. Uh, under the platform, there are two spectrometers. Yeah. The the first one is a multi-channel uh, one. The second one is the high dispersion one. Okay, uh, the instruments of MVST is uh, not so uh, not so complex. Uh, we have a multi-channel high resolution image system, uh, include the uh, photosphere and the chromosphere channel. Yeah, and a multi-band spectrometer and a high dispersion spectrometer. The resolution of the multi-band spectrometer is only. Um, a hundred thousand, and the the resolution of the high dispersion spectrometer is about uh, thirty, yeah, thirty uh, thousand to uh, forty thousand. And we also have uh, a very good AL system with one hundred and fifty-one actuators. The polarization analyzer is working at the wavelengths of 0 0.5 micron. You have the, the, the famous line, uh, the Chinese people like to use this line to, to do the, um, the magnetic field measurement. Okay, here is some result of our spectrometers. Yeah. The first one is HR, the second one is Casio. The third one is uh, yeah is near infrared one yeah you could see the uh, uh, of wheels demon split yeah like this yeah at this time the slit is just covered it's just put on a very small uh, sunspot. This is the image of our HRFR to enable fear two. We could turn the, uh, the 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 central line of the uh, of this fear two from the uh, blue wing to the red wing. Uh, each step is only 0.5 angstrom. 
Yeah. Oh no, open the wall. Yeah, open the wall, Armstrong. And the bandwidth of this theater is open to two. Yeah. Uh, I will introduce some uh, recent highlights of the one meter solar telescope. You can see the uh, the bright points, the granulation, the amber dots, the penumbra, uh, and uh, many details uh, in this image. Uh, this image is uh, taken by the MVST with his uh, with its uh, high resolution uh, image tunnel. Uh, and uh, the bandwidth uh, is TIO, the molecule line of, of, uh, of the song. Mm. I'm afraid not of the song, yeah. Of course, yeah. Anyway, uh, um, it shows many details uh, of, the, of this active region. This is the paper uh, about the, uh, the, the, the bright points, yeah. Uh, uh, you can so the purpose of this observation is to uh, is to e investigate the relationship between the uh, statistical properties of bright points and the background uh, magnetic field. We choose three regions: region A, region B, and region C. In each region, uh, the the, the background the magnetic field is uh, quite different. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's the result. Uh, the BPs were classified into isoplanetic BPs and the non isoplanetic BPs. And we find uh, some very interesting uh, result of the BP. Uh, the first one, the NIBP are longer, larger and higher than the IBPs in left time areas intensity and the, the area intensity uh, contrast of both the ibps and the nibps are independent of magnetic field background uh, that's quite interesting both the ibps and the nibp live longer in weaker magnetic field background on average okay we also uh, do some very interesting uh, observation and the research uh, in the field of small-scale magnetic reconnections. Many clear small-scale magnetic reconnections have been observed by NVST, including some very interesting phenomena such as the narrow current sheet and the release of filament twist. Yeah, the above one. The above picture, yeah, the top picture, uh, is uh, show the uh, the release of a filament twist, uh, and and the next one, next picture, uh, is uh, a very typical, a typical, a very clear typical uh, small scale reconnection, yeah, observed by the uh, doctor Shu Hong Yang, and uh, I think this is the. A famous paper uh, is maybe the, the the first paper of the small small scale magnetic reconnection. Dr. Tian Hui uh, used MVST to, to do some uh, joint observation with uh, Aries, and uh, he found uh, some EBs may be headed to a very high temperature near uh, 100 southern Kevin. Uh, the MGK and the edge line can be used to investigate EBs. EBs means animal bus. OK, this paper uh, is also a very interesting paper. Uh, this paper is about uh, the triggering. The triggering of the eruption of the uh, filaments, and also, I think, uh, is also the the triggering, the trigger of the uh, the M class uh, flare. Yeah, this M class flare 
uh, is uh, very clear. And uh, from the beginning, from the, uh, the start time to the end time. Uh, although we have excellent scene in Fuxian Solar uh, Observatory, so we could observe very clear prominence uh, uh, image and the movie. Yeah. Dr. Shen Yuan Den and also uh, include my group uh, find some fine uh, magnetic structures uh, inside uh, the uh, in, inside this uh, uh, prominence. It's a, a quiescent prominence. Yeah. Up to now, there are about uh, seventy research papers have benefited. Uh, from high resolution data from NVSD uh, since uh, I think five years ago. Yeah? Most of these papers were published in the APG series. Uh, this is the, the bird view of uh, Fuxian Solar Observatory. Uh, we could see the, uh, the NVSD is working. And uh, beside MVST, um, here's another uh, small uh, building. Yeah, this is on set optical and a near infrared solar eruption tracer. This telescope uh, is uh, um, developed by the Nanjing University and running by a Yunnan Observatory. The purpose of the original purpose of this telescope uh, is to uh, to check the uh, solar eruption and especially the white light flare. Yeah, uh, several white light flare uh, was found in the uh, 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 past years. Yeah, uh, this telescope is a, a multi-tube vacuum telescope. Yeah. Uh, we could see the full disk image. And we can also room, room it uh, by uh, uh, enlarging the, uh, the field uh, from the full disk to 10 arc seconds to see more details inside uh, active region. And uh, I do think this telescope is uh, not only for, his, uh, uh, for itself, uh, the science purpose, the science cases, but also uh, very good for the uh, the high resolution observation of MVST. It, it's a quite a good supplement uh, because of the larger FOV. Uh, you know, the the FOV of MVST is only uh, three arc second. The two meter ring solar telescope uh, is the new one. Yeah, uh, we are doing our best to develop this uh, new telescope. Uh, it's the prototype of our eight meter uh, Chinese giant solar telescope. And the, the left side, the, uh, the left side is the uh, mechanical uh, structure, and the, the right side. Uh, is the uh, optical uh, uh, figure. This telescope is uh, very simple, um, no platform. Uh, the instrument just uh, behind the uh, the primary mirror uh, to to keep the uh, symmetrical uh, structure. We will install this telescope. I mean the two meter ring solar telescope uh, behind our one meter uh, new vacuum solar telescope. Uh, it has only one instrument, the magnetograph, uh, because you know the uh, structure of one meter MVST is a little bit complex, and the uh, calibration. I mean the calibration of a uh, uh, magnetic field uh, in, uh, instrument uh, is quite difficult. So our purpose is to uh, use the two-meter ring solar telescope uh, to be a 
very, very simple magnetograph, no turn. Yeah, only uh, the, the uh, the instrument just uh, followed the uh, the primary mirror to keep uh, uh, very good, the quite good uh, symmetrical structure. Yeah. And uh, um, now uh, we are doing our best to to do the uh, the mechanical uh, the the mechanics structure of this telescope. Uh, the primary mirror. Uh, as showing in, in this slide, the primary mirror of this telescope uh, was finished uh, three months ago. Uh, as this telescope is quite simple, so the budget is not so big. We only need uh, three million US dollars to do this telescope. The first light of this telescope uh, is about, uh, I think, I wish, yeah, the end of this year or uh, or the beginning uh, of the next year. Yeah, we will install the telescope uh, just behind the one meter new vacuum solar telescope. Yeah, as I have said, the uh, two meter ring telescope is the prototype of our Chinese giant solar telescope. Um, the Chinese giant solar telescope uh, uh, is a eight meter telescope, yeah, with uh, uh, thirty eight uh, square meters collecting area, and eight meter resolution time two. Observing fundamental MHD structure in solar atmosphere uh, is the core, the core science, the science uh, goal uh, of uh, CGST, yeah. The question is, what is the fundamental MHD structure of the solar atmosphere? It's partially in the photosphere or on the photosphere. Yeah, uh, uh, magneto elements. Yeah, I call it tiny uh, flux tube. The second one is, could we observe such a tiny and maybe very weak structure by a large ground-based solar telescope? So uh, I don't think the, the science goal of uh, the three uh, giant solar telescope, the EST, uh, the Dickerst, the Dickerst uh, has just shown his uh, engineering first light yeah, uh, several days ago. So what we wanted is tiny flux tube. Also the magnetic elements, the scale is 10, to 200 kilometers lifetime is seconds to minutes. The magnetic flux density is just several gauss to, uh, to kg. The closely related cases and the questions is the local dynamo, corona heating, triggering, you know, the other small scale activities and uh, uh, the very important uh, uh, science cases, internet magnetic field. This is the observation capabilities of uh, Chinese giant solar telescope. Uh, the special resolution uh, could arrive uh, about 10 kilometers on the sun uh, at the visible band. Yeah. The polarization uh, accuracy is two yeah, uh, plus uh, 10 minus four power. The temperature the temporal resolution of images only one second, uh, but for the uh, a magnetic field uh, measurement is ten seconds. The spectral range, the field of view, is a, a little bit uh, small than MVST. Uh, I think uh, in, in, in some case it could uh, reach the three arc minutes, but. Uh, uh, for most of the observation, it's only one arc minute. This is the optical system of a Chinese giant solar telescope. Yeah, a very complex. Yeah, to remove the uh, cross torque of the polarization light. This is a building in Clarier, 
of a Chinese giant solar telescope observation mode. Right. And the second one is uh, a installation mode. Yeah, we have a lift elevators for the uh, human, for the observer, and the lift for the, the primary mirror. Yeah. The scene of our new site is okay for the, uh, this big telescope. This is the average scene yeah, of the new site. The average scene is uh, it's at about 30 meters above the ground, just like the deepest, uh, the, uh, the mountain site, uh, the, the mountains, the ground layer of the mountain site is not so good. So we need a very high building. Uh, the, the, the height of this building is about uh, 50 meters. Okay, the state of CGST, uh, the large uh, uh, solar uh, uh, observation facilities was listed to national medal and a long-term plan for major science. Yeah, CGST was proposed as the only astronomical candidate for the national largest science facilities in the next five years. Uh, the total budget of CGST uh, uh, exceed uh, uh, 100 million US dollars and uh, include the telescope instrument, uh, the data pro, uh, procession system. Oh, I'm so sorry, not 100, 200 million. Yeah, 200 million US dollars. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is the MUSER, uh, our radio uh, interferometer. Uh, uh, it's uh, the uh, specifications of the MUSER. Uh, MUSER 1 and the MUSER 2, uh, the different uh, uh, in from the uh, arrays. Uh, this is the first uh, image, first slide of music. And uh, uh, yeah, now we have some uh, research results uh, by the music. Yeah. This is uh, a paper um, uh, present uh, in APJ uh, about the peripheral oscillations. I uh, some uh, observation result uh, of MUSER at uh, 500 uh, megahertz, 700 megahertz, and around one gigahertz. Uh, at the near future, uh, we will extend the observation uh, capability of MUSER uh, to uh, the low frequency uh, uh, part, yeah. This is the one meter aims of NAOC, the National Astronomical uh, Observation of China. Yeah. Uh, the working wavelengths of this uh, telescope uh, is about 10 micron. So it's a, a, a typical infrared telescope, uh, very high sensitivity to uh, detect, uh, to measure the magnetic field. Yeah. The first slide of this telescope, uh, I think is about uh, two years later. The site is very dry, you like, yeah, look at that here. It is a very dry site. And the attitude of this site is uh, about uh, 4,000 meters yeah, uh, above the sea level. Uh, this is another 2-meter telescope, 2.5-meter solar telescope of Nanjing University. Uh, the field of, field of this telescope is quite larger. Uh, it's uh, seven uh, arc minutes. We see the, the, the optical layout of this telescope. This telescope is not a pure solar telescope. It's also a, a nighttime uh, a telescope. So at daytime, it observed the sun. At nighttime, it observed the, uh, the stars, the clusters, the galaxies, and so on. OK. Uh, this is the location of MUSER, the one meter aims the infrared 
telescope. And this is the location, uh, the site of the 8 meter CGST, and also the 2.5 Nanjing Solar Telescope. Uh, and uh, here is 1 meter new vacuum solar telescope and the 2 meter rain solar telescope. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's all. All right. Finished well on time. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, yes. Hello, Liu Sang. Uh, uh, this is Ichimoto speaking. Hello. Can you hear? Uh, no, no, it's not so clear. Could you, could you repeat your question? Hello, uh, uh, you san <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, uh, but uh, I, I I cannot uh, hear the uh, uh, the question. Ah, I haven't said nothing. <laughs> my que one question is: uh, uh, You showed very good uh, uh, seeing condition uh, for the uh, of the site of four, eight meter and two point five meter uh, solar telescope. Uh, my question is: uh, You you uh, show the average uh, Friedo parameter, but what? Do you mean the average? Is this a uh, average from the sunrise to sunset, or some uh, certain time period? Could you hear? Can you hear uh, me? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, pardon. It's not so clear. Uh, okay. So, uh, 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 is there anybody could uh, repeat the yeah. the question I'll by? Uh, I'll uh, try. So he wants to know. Phone. When, when you were saying average seeing parameter, what is the average over? Is it over one full day or a few hours or what? Oh, not so seeing clear, parameter? sorry. You, which telescope? Which telescope? Uh, the candidate site for eight meter and 2.5 meter telescope. So the candidate sites for the eight meter and 2.5 meter Nanjing solar telescope? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so when you're saying oh, yeah. average seeing parameter, what is the average over? Is it a one day average? Oh, uh, uh, the average, uh, what? The, uh, the thread uh, parameter? The scene? Yes, or yes. The yes, yes. Rate? The scene? Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Okay, here. Uh, the scene above the 30 meters, uh, uh, the, yeah. the scene of, of the new site uh, above uh, uh, 30 meters above the ground, uh, like this. Yeah. What do you uh, mean by average? One year curve. One year's curve. Another year. That this year is uh, uh, 2014, and this year is uh, 2016. Yeah. The average scene is. Uh, uh about 11 yeah about 11 centimeter 11 centimeter uh, uh but the thing is uh uh the value above ground 30 meters above ground yeah. One year. and the social duration of this site the social duration of this site uh is it's not so bad and also not so good i think the social duration uh of this site is 2,500 hours per year. Am I, am I understand your question? It's not so clear. Could you, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello, yeah, can I repeat it? The question is the average, when you say there are different ways of taking average. Is it a median value? Is it a mean value? And is the mean value taken over a half an hour block period? Or is it a whole day average? That is the question. Mm, what? When you say that the average value of the seeing or the R naught value, I think it is R naught, 
11 centimeter, is it a average taken over the whole day? Or is it a one minute average? Uh, it's average, it's average value. It's average value. And the, the, the medium uh, value is, uh, it's just the same, yeah. 11 centimeter. But this value is not the, uh, uh, the, the value of uh, uh, ground layer and uh, not include uh, ground layer. Uh, it's the value of the total turbulence uh, above uh, 30 meters above the ground. But is it a model that 30 meters above the ground you're measuring it or you have a direct measurements at 30 meters? Uh, no, uh, uh, we measured this by uh, solar dim, yeah. So your uh, SDIM instrument is placed at 30 meter height? Oh, no. oh, From your that's picture. quite an interesting question. Yeah, yeah because your yeah, picture so doesn't show that. Uh, yeah, we have two dim. Uh, the first one is a solar dim. Uh, the second one is, uh, 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 is a new instrument. It's a new instrument. Uh, and uh, uh, to use the, uh, the opposite side of the solar lamp. Yeah, the diameter of this telescope is only uh, 10 centimeters. Yeah. The uh, the average uh, I think the average seen um, include the near ground layer uh, is only uh, eight uh, to nine uh, centimeters. The eight to nine centimeters value is uh, uh, is measured by the the, the typical solar dim. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Well, if not, let's uh, thank Dr. Liu for an excellent talk. Thank you. So um, the next talk will be by Professor Siraj Hassan on the National Large Solar Telescope. That's for moving the slide, right? That's for moving the slide. Okay. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me say that this is the, what I'm presenting is actually the work of a large number of people, and I'm just merely a representative of the, of the team and presenting the basically giving you a holistic picture. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with NLST, but I've uh, decided to be a little ambitious in this talk and cover a whole range of uh, uh, topics, which include the scientific objectives, site survey, design of the telescope, and the focal plane instruments. So, but before I do that, let me just uh, give you a little bit of background about the heritage of this uh, project, which uh, originated around 2007 when we proposed this uh, telescope in the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And at that time, we were given uh, in principle go ahead to carry out site characterization and also develop a concept design. Uh, the concept design was, uh, report was prepared by MT Mechatronics in Germany. And um, it was uh, submitted to the 
Department of, Sa uh, Department of Science and Technology, DST, and it got included in the mega astronomy projects of the government of India. Uh, then there was a kind of a hiatus for a long period of time. Um, and then finally, in 2017, uh, revised another version of the DPR was sub uh, sent, uh, sent, uh, submitted to the Department of Science and Technology. And uh, about a year ago, uh, we received uh, um, 56.5 million rupees, which is five and a half crore of rupees from the DST to acquire the land for the project. So that was really the first kind of financial involvement of the government in this project, and that's a very hopeful sign. Uh, in June of last year, uh, it was uh, the Department of Expenditure, the DOE, provided in principle agreement, and then the Standing Finance Committee, uh, the document was circulated to various departments. That's the standard procedure. Uh, and Niti Aayog is basically the successor to the Planning Commission in India. And uh, then reports were obtained from several departments, and all of them were very positive. Uh, so now actually the, the next step is just a meeting of the SFC, uh, which once that uh, committee clears the project, then we should be well on the way to getting the project formally started. Now, uh, the, the two sort of main objectives uh, the sort of underlying philosophy is to have a good angular resolu resolution as well as a good optical throughput. And if you probably all remember that the angular resolution is basically the ratio of the wavelength to the diameter of the telescope. And at 500 uh, nanometers, the resolution of uh, telescopes with aperture one and a half meter, something like uh, Gregor or GST, two meter, which would be the NLST, and some of the instruments, uh, the uh, project, the instrument which was discussed earlier, and the four meter DKIST uh, would be 60, 45, and 22 and a half kilometers respectively. Uh, but in addition to having a good angular resolution, you also need a good optical throughput. So now the broad scientific requirements uh, for having a a large diameter is basically to be able to resolve the tiny structures in the solar atmosphere. And uh, both the theoretical simulations as well as new observations suggest that there are, in fact, very interesting physical processes taking place on sub arc seconds, like flux tubes, vortex flows, and flux cancellation. And we actually, uh, there were some examples of this described in the talk just before lunch. Uh, and then, of course, in addition to that, we need to be able to measure the vector magnetic fields precisely. Uh, so these are basically the two major sort of guiding uh, requirements for our telescope. Now, I've already mentioned uh, about these two points. But in addition to that, uh, in order to realize the telescope in a, in a small period of time, about a few years, three or four years, we decided to follow a a design based on Gregor, which is already working quite well, uh, so that we could realize, uh, achieve our objectives in about three or four years, and also uh, keep the costs uh, down. So if we start from the, the current sort of large telescopes, greater than one and a half meters, if we start from the left, you have DKIST. Uh, then you have the Goody Solar Telescope, which is 1.6. And then you have uh, the Gregor, uh, and also, I hope in course of time, you'll have the European Solar Telescope there. And then you'll have NLST, which fills an important longitude gap. Uh, I should also mention, in addition to that, there will be the Chinese telescopes, which we just heard about earlier on. OK, so the broad scientific aims is, as I mentioned, uh, is to study of magnetic fields, but also to understand, for example, uh, processes related to the dynamo, to the magnetic coupling. And there's going to be a session in this uh, conference about magnetic coupling uh, to study local helioseismology, measure weak magnetic fields in the intergranular network, study the thermal structure of the chromosphere, and look at energetic phenomena and activity, for example, active prominences, loops, CMEs, et cetera. 
Now, uh, one of the questions you might ask that if you go from the quiet sun and you move to a plage and then to a sunspot, you find that the average magnetic field increases, um, which probably uh, decreases the horizontal scale of convection, and so the convective energy transport decreases. But you might wonder how much of this uh, structure can we hope to detect? Uh, so that's one of the one of the sort of objectives. The other is, as I mentioned, is the solar dynamo. Now, the solar dynamo has parameters such as diffusion, helicity, which are not accurately determined. So one of the objectives of NLST would be to understand the convective flows and uh, the stretching of field lines to be able to understand how these field lines in sunspots, filaments, interact with flows, and then also to study large-scale convective uh, uh, of flows on the sun. Uh, another objective is to be able to look at the structure, the detailed structure and dynamics of sunspots. The top uh, two figures are taken from the Swedish uh, telescope, a one meter telescope, and the right panel actually shows you a more detailed observation of a sunspot. And the lower panel is uh, our observations taken uh, with the Goody Solar Telescope. And you can actually see, for example, very clearly, you can see the light bridges. You can see convective flows. You can see fibrils. And uh, basically, uh, uh, you are able to now probe the sunspots with, uh, with a very sort of with, a, with like a magnifying lens. This is an uh, image which is taken from Samantha's paper, which appeared recently in Science. Uh, and this is, uh, these are observations, again, taken uh, with the GST. Uh, shows you observations at different levels. Uh, but what is interesting is that how, how well you can see the, the spicule. So the lower three panels actually show the observations taken with the GST. And the top panel is for comparison taken with the AIA on STO. Uh, so now you have small scale, it is well known that small scale uh, magnetic fields are in fact present in the intergranular net, uh, at the network boundaries. Uh, and these are very important for understanding the energy transport that takes place. Uh, so an NLST will, with its good spatial and temporal resolution, would, would like to understand some of the theoretical predictions uh, of how these flux tubes are formed and to study their interaction with the uh, with the flows. Uh, another important uh, objective uh, is to be able to carry out observations at different heights so that uh, you can get a holistic picture of the processes that are taking place in the solar atmosphere. And the two uh, panels on the left and right uh, show observations taken with different telescopes. I think that the first one is taken with the Swedish solar telescope, and the right one is uh, taken using ROSA. Uh, and again, uh, you see very, at different layers, you can see very fine structure, uh, which gives you uh, detailed information about what is going on in the solar atmosphere at different levels. So uh, before uh, you can actually go, uh, the most, one of the most important things is also the site. And un unless you don't have a good site, uh, it doesn't really make any sense to have a very large aperture telescope. So with that in mind, we began a site survey at three places. Uh, at Hanle, where we already have a stellar observatory, at the Pangong Lake, and at Devastal out here. And after a very careful analysis, uh, we decided that the best site, and I'll show you why we chose uh, Merak, the site on the Pangong Lake, uh, based on what, what are the reasons for choosing it. So we chose the Merak site, the one on the Pangong Lake. And this is basically shows you the lake. The arrow shows you a little incursion on the lake. And uh, the bottom left panel shows you a more detailed picture of where the uh, telescope will be located. So it's going to be at a height of 4,350 meters. It's uh, on a lake which is very long. 40% of it is in India. Most of it is in China. Uh, it is uh, uh, about 175 kilometers from Leh. Uh, now, we, we actually 
put a whole suite of instruments. And for the STM, we had basically uh, two, sorry, we had two spells, one in 2000, from 2008 to 2009, and the other from 2017 to 18. Uh, and the weather uh, data we have for 10 years, the old sky camera for 10 years, and about two years ago, we installed a H alpha telescope. So these uh, two uh, figures uh, show you the results of the STEM for the two years, 2007 to 2008 to 2009 on the left, and 2017 to 2018 on the, on the right. Uh, and you can see that the, the median uh, R naught is about 5.5 based on the, the first uh, set of observations, and it's about 6.2 or so based on the second one. Uh, this shows you the number of, again, for the two periods, shows you the number of uh, 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 observation, uh, hours of observation. Uh, the yellow shows you the period where the R naught is greater than seven. And so you can see that clearly there are large number of hours where you get seeing which, for which the Fritz parameter is greater than seven. Uh, now, in order to find a suitable height for the telescope, we decided to actually also uh, carry out Shabar observations. And uh, so you find that as, uh, as, you, go, as you go above the ground, uh, the seeing improves very rapidly, and it sort of saturates around 20 meters. And so that was, uh, that's uh, the reason that we decided to actually put the telescope at about 20 meters. Uh, now, we also carried out very detailed uh, analysis of the wind conditions. And as you can see, that uh, the wind direction is more or less constant. It's, it flows along the direction of the lake from northwest to southeast. Uh, the pattern is usually quite, it's between you know, a few meters per second, five to seven meters per second. Uh, I mean, there are also, there are also uh, times when it is, uh, but on the whole, the wind conditions are very good, very favorable for doing solar observations. Uh, then we compared the humidity distribution uh, for, for a typical year in 2010, but it's, if you look at it, we have 10 years of data. It doesn't vary that much. And we compared this with uh, Haleakala, which is uh, the uh, Dikis site. And as you can see, that uh, uh, Merak actually has, uh, has, uh, has reasonably low uh, humidity. So it's a dry site. Uh, these two tables basically uh, show you the summary of the site survey results. Uh, I'm not going to repeat all of them, you can see. Um, but for example, if you take the number of annual sunshine hours, uh, compared, you compare uh, Mera, Kalekala, and, uh, B, uh, and Big Bear, BBSO, you find that um, uh, Mera actually holds its own. Uh, and uh, in, if you look at the, the number of blocks, for example, annual blocks, of two hours with R naught greater than seven, you can you find that Merak at 18 meters, Big Bear at 26 to 28 meters, which is where the uh, that is where the instrument uh, where the telescope is located, are fairly uh, are fairly comparable. So, I think the uh, the message that one takes back from all this is that Merak is an excellent site for carrying out solar observations. Uh, now. The design, as I mentioned, we decided to follow the design of Gregor, which is basically an on-axis Gregorian system. Uh, the meter is, uh, the, the aperture is two meters. Um, it has uh, a field of view of uh, 300 arc seconds, of which 200 is corrected by adaptive optics. Uh, the wavelength of operation is 3,800 angstroms to about 2.5 microns. Uh, we expect a uh, a polarization accuracy of better than one part in 10,000. Uh, it will have active and adaptive optics to be able to get as close to the diffraction limit as possible, and a spatial resolution uh, of less than one, a tenth of an arc second at uh, 500 angstroms. 
Uh, this shows you the ray diagram. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's uh, the ray fall, uh, the light falls on the primary M1. It's focused onto F1, uh, and that's where you have a heat stop where most of the heat is actually removed. It then falls on a second mirror. Sorry. On a second mirror, M2, then goes down and falls on a field lens, and then it comes down to M3, and then it's deflected out of the central region by a flat mirror, M4, where it goes to the uh, tip tilt and the deformable mirrors. And finally, it reaches the instrument, uh, the table where you have all the instruments. Now, one of the uh, positive features of this uh, is, uh, telescope is that it has only six mirrors compared to Gregor, which has uh, many more. I think it has about 18 mirrors. Uh, but one of the the, the problems of all solar telescopes, including this one, is that how do you get rid of the heat? And uh, so, as I said, some of the heat is actually removed at, uh, at F1. Uh, the primary mirror is basically cooled by circulating cool air from below through nozzles. Sorry. Through nozzles. Uh, and the heat stop will be cooled by, cooled by uh, circulating uh, liquid. Um, there is, of course, uh, all, there is a problem, of course, of uh, about 300 watts, and extensive uh, analysis needs to be done. How do we get rid of that residual amount of heat? Now, the telescope structure, as I said, based on our Shaba results, would be uh, at a height of about 20 meters above the ground. And these figures, schematically, I'm not going to go into all the details, but you can see them. Uh, actually shows you uh, schematically the different elements of the telescope structure. And you see that uh, on top you have a, you have a dome. Uh, and again, after very careful studies, our group came to the conclusion that uh, we should go in for an open, open dome. And uh, then, of course, the question comes is, how do you actually open the dome without using excessive power? And it should be done in a fairly short amount of time. And uh, after several concepts were, were put forward, and the one that finally was uh, accepted was the one which, which you see in this, in this uh, little, little animation. Uh, so it's actually open, and then it, it gets pushed the enclosure gets pushed down, and uh, it takes approximately three minutes to do this. Uh, and it uses, we found that it doesn't have very excessive power requirements. So now um, uh, let me come to the choice of the, the focal plane instruments. Uh, we're going to basically have base with standard uh, uh, first light instruments, which include a broadband imaging system, uh, which will have uh, filters, different types of filters, an H-alpha, calcium, and CN band, and the continuum. And then there will be uh, a tunable fabry narrow narrowband imager, uh, and a high-resolution spectrograph and polarimeter. Uh, that will be in the first phase, uh, and then we hope uh, in the second phase to extend the capabilities of the instrument to infrared. So there's already quite a tall order to be able to get uh, these three instruments uh, ready in time. Uh, so the broad uh, band imaging system will basically uh, operate in, uh, in different, uh, as I mentioned, in, uh, in different wavelengths. Uh, and uh, it's shows you, for example, these are, this is, a, for example, just an illustration of what you might be able to achieve. Uh, it's a comparison with the, uh, the ROSA instrument. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going to have, uh, uh, it, we hope to be able to take, uh, have a very high cadence so, so as to be able to, to use image reconstruction techniques. And this is, again, an illustration showing you 
uh, using speckle interferometry, inter, uh, uh, image reconstruction, uh, how an image would look before and after the image reconstruction. The second instrument uh, which I mentioned is the narrowband imager. Uh, and uh, this will have uh, calcium, HNK, calcium infrared line, 8542. Uh, and it will, of course, have H-alpha. Uh, and uh, the idea is to be able to, to look at uh, different types of phenomena, which include sunspot. I've already talked about this in the, in the earlier part of my presentation, and also look at filaments, prominences in several wavelengths. Uh, the specifications are it will have a spectral resolution of about 200,000 at uh, 6,000 angstroms, a uh, field of view of 1.5 arc minutes, which is uh, the field of view of the telescope, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, it will have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, a high cadence to be able to get one image per second. Uh, and this is a comparison of uh, the NLST uh, narrowband imager with existing um, uh, narrowband imaging systems or at least the ones we are familiar with. Uh, there's TESOS, uh, which is at the, uh, the VTT, IBIS, which is at the National Solar Observatory, uh, and the lower one is the one on the Gregor telescope. So this shows you uh, that the, the capabilities of the NLST compared to uh, the imaging, narrowband imaging systems on other telescopes. Uh, the last uh, uh, instrument which, uh, uh, and the focal plane instrument that we want to have is a spectropolarimeter. Uh, as I mentioned, it should have a sensitivity of uh, one part in 10,000. Um, should, uh, this gives you what the polarization, the wavelength coverage, uh, the wavelength resolution of 20 milli angstroms. Uh, time cadence to be able to resolve the, to be able to get the four components of the magnetic field. Uh, so you need roughly about two and a half seconds to get each component and uh, a field of view of 120 arc seconds. Uh, and it would study uh, a whole host of problems, including the velocity and magnetic fields in the quiet sun, uh, magnetic uh, coupling, which I talked about earlier, uh, prominences, Hanle polarization measurements, emerging flux regions, uh, magnetic helicity, uh, and activity. Um, so this shows you, uh, gives you a little more details about uh, the spectropolarimeter at, at uh, operating at different, uh, at different wavelengths. I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, you can read them. Um, so now the current status of this project is, as I, as I stated earlier, it's going to be at uh, at Mirak on the Ping Pangong Lake, and uh, the land for this uh, telescope has already been acquired. Uh, we expect the formal approval to take place sometimes this year, hopefully before the end of the year. And once that uh, uh, formal approval comes, we want to begin the fabrication of NLST uh, early next year in 2021. Uh, which will include a flo floating a global tender for fabrication of the telescope. So we expect the telescope to be made by an international consortium. Um, uh, and hopefully, we should be able to get first light by 2024. The back-end instruments are going to be developed in-house uh, and in collaboration with, um, uh, with the National Institutes, for example, uh, the uh, PRL, the Udaipur Solar Observatory, has uh, offered to make the narrowband imager. And uh, then we are also, of course, open to uh, offers for uh, external collaborations as well. So the, this is my last slide. The particip participating institutions are, uh, the nodal institution is the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, and our national partners are the Physical Research Laboratory, Ares and Nanitar, the Indian Space Research Organization, various universities, the Institute of Science, different ISAs and IITs. Uh, international partners are the 
we have uh, presently already a formal commitment from Queen's University of Belfast. And uh, other uh, organizations, for example, the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen and the Leibniz Institute in Freiburg, amongst others, have shown interest in participation. Uh, once the project is formally approved, uh, then I expect that uh, all they, we, we, we should be able to get some more offers of uh, collaboration. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Questions, please? There. I think you didn't mention about the uh, AO, uh, adaptive op optics. And what is the plan? And the, uh, what well, is the plan for the uh, MCAO? Yeah, the details, the adaptive optics actually at this point is still in a, in a fairly preliminary stage. And uh, maybe Ravindra, is, if he's there, is Ravindra there? It, Ravindra, can you uh, shed some light on this question? The question is, uh, can you say a little bit about the AO of NLST? What type of AO we expect to have? Adaptive optics uh, will be built uh, in the initial stage, but uh, MCAO in the later stage, uh, we are going to do it. And uh, this will cover how many actuators? How many actuators do you expect to have? Uh, about 25 into 24, about uh, 496 uh, actuators, something like that. You want to say something, Dipanka? No, I think he said it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anand. Just a comment. Hmm. This is wonderful progress. Now, did anybody study the settlement on the ground at the Merak Lake over the last so many years? I can't hear you very well. Settlement. Yes. Ground settlement. Yes. At the Merak Lake. Yes. Over the last ten years. Has there been any study? No, when we put all this weight. <laughs> well, I think of late there has been some. Can you repeat the question loudly so that everybody can hear? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I have it. Maybe I can ask. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Is, uh, about the ground settlement he's asking. Yeah, the lake uh, water level is actually coming up a little more. And we have lost uh, a bit of soil as well. On the side, so we have put some, uh, you know, temporary barricades and, and so on uh, this uh, summer. Uh, this is a little concern because you know there is an intrusion in the lake, and we are trying to build the telescope in this intrusion site. So it will be important to protect that intrusion, uh, you know, part of it. So uh, there, there has not been a detailed uh, soil testing, which is also part of the, the you know project cost. Uh, which will only dictate us how closer to the to the water body we should go. So that uh, is yet to be done. One, but because it, it does uh, cost you quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. So that has not been done uh, into that detail. Because also the piling, you know, all those things will be quite importantly, you know, has to be studied once we do the proper soil test. Uh, no, I don't think we have that uh, no, I don't think know, information. Yeah. Because it's a variable depth, and also you know, the water get, gets completely frozen during the winter and so on. So there are uh, you know, at least 30 meters in the, in the middle of the lake, which is only three uh, kilometer in, in, uh, in, in width or wide at Merak site. Okay. Uh, Debendra has a question. Siraj, it seems to me that uh, with this very large solar telescopes, every country is sort of going independently on this, right? Um, if you look at the astronomical community, with the very large telescopes, there is collaboration among countries where they're putting in all the money and efforts and building this sort of, you know, one telescope, maybe, maybe at most two. So do you think that there is things that we can learn from other experiences like the, you know, the, the Dickest uh, or the European Large Solar Telescope and maybe you know, use similar techniques, technologies, so that the turnaround time is larger, uh, shorter, and we can save time, and maybe have more collaboration than going alone in all these different countries in Asia? 
Well, f first of all, I'm not sure we can take any lesson from EST because that project has, has been on hold for a while. But yes, uh, certainly um, uh, we can. But you know, it's not due, due to lack of trying. We have been approaching, in fact, for the more than 10 years, various organizations, international as well as national. But uh, the problem is that till people don't know whether a project is close to or at least going to get formally approved, nobody is uh, willing to put aside human and financial resources for that. So some time ago, had, for example, NLST received the formal clearance, I mean, in principle, a group approval, um, at that time, uh, the Max Planck Institute said they would be willing to participate in the development of the polarimeter. And the Leibniz Institute said they were willing to participate in the adaptive optics development. But uh, because of the fact that over a long period of time, uh, you know, the, the, the project approval has taken so long that uh, even we find it, we are also a little bit reluctant to ask people to come forward and participate because unless they have some basis for knowing. I mean, nobody is going to put aside uh, their resources until they know the project. So I think once the formal clearance comes, and hopefully by before the end of this year, I think we will take this up on a more aggressive footing. Okay. Um, okay. So one last question. Just a, uh, just a comment. The first light image of the dickest is actually taken from an Andor camera built in Queen's University of Belfast. So this is again one probably, you know, a site that in future also this international participation could be, could be interesting. It is built in, in Belfast. Right. Okay. So thank you, Professor Hassan. Um, we will... Uh, now move on to the next and the last talk of this. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, so, uh, Shibu Matthew will uh, tell us about the multi application solar telescope. Uh, after hearing all uh, two meter, four meter, and eight meter telescope, I am going to uh, take you down to 50 centimeter telescope. I ho hope you will not get bored because of that. So this is uh, a telescope which is uh, 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 which is a 50 centimeter telescope. Uh, I will uh, uh, go through some of the details of the telescope. So this is basically called multi-application solar telescope because you can kind of this will be used for uh, different uh, observations in different wavelengths and also used with different uh, instruments. Uh, this is basically meant to uh, obtain uh, observations in uh, uh, different wavelengths. For example, uh, from uh, 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 photospheric to uh, chromospheric heights. And uh, the telescope is uh, located uh, around 800 kilometers uh, from Pune to, uh, to the north. Uh, and the uh, uh, location is actually the, the longitude and latitude is uh, uh, noted here. And the observatory is situated in the middle of a, of a, a lake. The, uh, this is uh, the Fatsagar Lake. And uh, uh, you can see this in the, middle, uh, uh, kind of in the middle of the lake. You see the, the domes and then the, the uh, protecting structures for the, the telescope. So the telescope is commissioned in uh, 2015, and uh, Professor Venkit uh, was the, uh, the PA of the, is the PA of the, this telescope. So as I told you earlier, uh, this, uh, the, the size of the telescope is 50 centimeter, and the telescope is a off-axis telescope. It's basically to reduce the scattered light uh, from the uh, structure supporting the secondary meter. Uh, this is this will help in uh, a kind of observations in the channel, for example, in uh, prominence and uh, that kind of a paint structures. So the 
when we installed the telescope, we tested the telescope uh, for the transmitted uh, wavefront accuracy and found that it's around lambda by 12, which is uh, according to the, uh, uh, as per the uh, specifications. So we have a, so this is the primary mirror and then we have uh, the secondary mirror. So this is almost like the focal length is around two meters. So you have a secondary mirror which is uh, installed on a hexa pole, which can uh, control uh, actively. And then we have uh, thermal control for the entire telescope. The entire, entire uh, mirrors which are sitting in the, in the uh, top floor where the mirrors are exposed to the outside the environment. So these are the mirrors like M1, M2, M3, and M4, and M5 are exposed to the outside environment. And this is, all these mirrors are, the thermal uh, the temperature of the, all these mirrors are controlled uh, by a active thermal control loop. So uh, the telescope, so what you see here is the, the telescope structure. So the primary, the, the primary mirror is sitting somewhere here. So you have a sun shield which kind of uh, protect the, the remaining structure from the direct uh, sunlight. So the secondary uh, mirror is sitting here and you, it's sitting on a hexa port. So uh, the whole uh, telescope is sitting on the telescope floor view and then the light, and it is mounted on a ultra smooth mount. So what you get is you get the light down to the observing floor through this hole here. And this telescope is again uh, protected by a collapsible dome, which is similar to the, the Grigor one, where uh, uh, the, the this kind of a dome helps in uh, removing the, the thermal load uh, from the telescope uh, because of the, the mild wind outside. So this is the uh, uh, look when it is the dome is closed and all the instruments are sitting in this uh, uh, bottom floor here. So for this telescope, we have a uh, suite of uh, backend instruments. Some of them are uh, listed here. So what we have is a uh, H-alpha and uh, G-band imager. Then uh, we also have uh, just started uh, the adaptive optic system for the, the telescope. So you also have a uh, multi spectrograph. This is uh, from uh, URSC, Bangalore. Uh, then a uh, narrow band imager and the associated uh, polarimeter. So as I told you earlier, so if you remember, If you remember uh, this mirror, this M6 is uh, uh, situated here. This is the M6. So this can be rotated into any four directions so that you can accommodate uh, almost like four instruments in any, any of these directions. So this is our uh, main table for the, the backend instruments. And uh, this, has, this have, uh, has H alpha and uh, G band uh, filters. Yeah. So this. Uh, the telescope gives you a focal uh, beam, and then uh, the uh, this lens uh, refocuses it at a uh, point in the in the back in the back instrument chamber. So I will uh, give some details about the HF and uh, G band uh, filter here. So G band image is basically a simple uh, uh, broadband inference filter, which is having a one nanometer passband with a uh, PCO Sensicam CCD, and it can observe around three arc minute uh, field of view, uh, and also have a time guidance of 10, 10 frames per second. Uh, the H alpha imager uses a very old uh, Halley filter with a 500 milliangstrom passband, and is having a 1K by 1K photon mark CCD, and also can observe uh, three arc minute field of view with a uh, five frames per second which is enough to cover any active region uh, dynamics. So this is basically just uh, bring, uh, the L1 brings the beam to the uh, beam splitter and then split into two and then, uh, so this can be, these two cameras can be simultaneously operated such that actually we can get uh, simultaneous images from uh, uh, G band and H alpha. I will show you few images uh, taken with this. So these are some old images, but these are uh, kind of when you have a good seeing condition, what you get is uh, images like this. So this is 
the H alpha and the, this is a G1. So you can see you sometimes kind of when the seeing is good, you get a diffraction limited almost like uh, images from this uh, telescope. So all this, so we were collecting data from this uh, uh, from these instruments uh, for the last few years, and then all the uh, the images are now available in on a, the, on our website. So starting from 2017 to uh, 2019, whenever we observe, we start putting the data uh, in the in the PRL page. So we'll go to the the next uh, instrument. So the adaptive optics is basically as a tip tilt mirror and a short shark uh, Hartman uh, wavefront sensor with around 37 activities. It's a basically a deformable mirror. Uh, now we started operating. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, adaptive optics uh, and this getting integrated with the other uh, instruments. Now this can, uh, uh, this is capable of locking to uh, two sunspot and uh, ports. So these two images shows, uh, this image shows an average of 500 total images in 48 seconds taken without uh, the adaptive optics system. And this is the same observation taken with the adaptive optics system. You simply just uh, getting this same images with an after and before the adaptive optic system. So I will show you another movie which uh, tells you about the, this thing. So this is a movie, I think it's using the same uh, data set. So this is uh, without uh, the adaptive optic system and the, with, uh, with the IO. But still, uh, we need to improve. But uh, I think we are almost there to uh, kind of uh, uh, locking the, the, the system to uh, sunspots and ports. So, I think I will tell uh, about this later. So another uh, instrument which we have, uh, 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 which is working in our telescope, is a narrowband imager. So this narrowband imager uh, uses two lithium neighbor etalons in tandem. These lithium neighbor etalons are the similar ones which is used in uh, sunrise mission, and also it will be used in uh, uh, solar orbiter mission. So this basically. A lithium nibet crystal instead of uh, the conventional uh, fabric pedo where you have two plates and uh, changing the distance between the plate instead of that what you have is a lithium nibet crystal polished on both sur both the, the sides uh, like 200 micron 300 micron lithium nibet crystal polished on both sides and uh, coated with uh, high reflectivity coatings and also with the uh, indian tin oxide coating uh, the these lithium nibet uh, uh, crystals are uh, electro-optically sensitive. So by applying a voltage, what you can do is you can change the refractive index of the crystal and then uh, tune the, uh, the uh, filter into different wavelengths. Uh, so this system, uh, narrowband imager, is having two separate channels, one for uh, 6173 nanometer and the other for 8542 nanometer lines. And uh, this can also be used for simultaneous observations, photosphere and chromosphere. So here you can see the, the, the optical layout. So light from M6, the, the mirror which I showed you earlier, sorry, the lens which I showed you earlier, make a focus here. And then uh, you have uh, one FP, and we have a dichroic beam splitter. And then that uh, light is taken to a SEMOS camera uh, and uh, uh, through a interference filter. So this channel is basically for the 8542 nanometer because 8542 line is broad, so you can have a slightly broader passband for the 8542 channel. So this single FP with uh, the interference filter gives you around uh, 170 milliangstrom passband. And uh, when we use the 6173 line, or when we are putting the light to 6173 uh, angstrom camera, so what we have is two FPs in tandem. The these two FPs together gives you around uh, uh, 70 milliangstrom passband, which is around 1 million um, uh, resolving uh, so, uh, resolution, actually. So this is a bare FP which we got from, I think this is now kind of, you can say, extinct. So now they, the, this we got from uh, CSR Australia, and now they are not making uh, these FPs, actually. So this we got from uh, CSR, is around 60 millimeter uh, uh, diameter. So this is the same FP with the temperature controlled and closed, which we made, which gives you around uh, 0 0.01 degree accuracy, temperature stability. So I just 
give you an idea about the the uh, the the, uh, the filters which I uh, showed you earlier. So what we did is actually for characterizing the filter, what we did is actually we just uh, put the light into a spectro uh, litro spectrograph and place the Fabry Perot's in front of the the spectrograph. So what you get is you get the channel spectrum, and also simultaneously we are getting the the solar spectra on the top. So this is the 6173 angstrom line here you can see the, the, the spectra so uh, with a single fp what you get is you get uh, uh, three channels with uh, both the fps you get much more uh, sorry here uh, you mean for the second fp you get much more channels but comparing these two what you get is you get a single channel uh, with a width of the, uh, uh, the, the with a width of the the, uh, the uh, thicker fp which is uh, narrower than the thinner fp so effectively what you do is you remove all these other channels, at least several of them, and then uh, get a single channel. And then by putting a pre uh, blocking filter, you can get the uh, single channel isolated from that. Now, if you see, when you apply a voltage, for example, minus 3,000 volts, the channels are shifted to the, uh, to the left side. And when you apply plus 3,000 volts, the channels are shifted to the right side. So by changing the voltage, you can kind of basically tune the depth filter to any wavelength on the 6173 angstrom line. So this shows you the the filter passband, yeah. Uh, the filter pass, the combined filter passband uh, log scale actually. So this is the the effective uh, full width maximum is around uh, 70 milli angstroms in this case. So we'll go to the the some of the uh, the observations what we got. So this is uh, 6.73 angstrom line scan. So the the full width tab maximum of this line is around uh, I think around 100. Uh, less than 100 milli angstrom. So you can very nicely reproduce the, the line profile by tuning the filter by applying a voltage. So this, uh, uh, yeah, this, this uh, line scan is taken, uh, can be taken uh, with a wavelength uh, step of uh, less than uh, point zero, zero, that, that is around uh, 10 milli angstroms here. So these are basically, uh, I think the line entry is somewhere here. I think somewhere here. So the blue, no, this this uh, line center, and then you can go to any. So all these markings which are showed here uh, shows you different uh, uh, wavelengths on the line profile. So this is uh, another example. So as I told you earlier, so the calcium line also we can uh, kind of we can tune the filter on the calcium line also. So, but only problem is actually in the calcium line, since the calcium line is very broad, the, there is a limit for uh, uh, tuning. So that limit is around plus or minus one angstroms. So the, this, this red circles are, this, this spectrum is taken from the, the bus 2000 uh, catalog. So this is uh, the H by 4 to calcium line. So what we can do is we can tune out from, uh, we can't go to the continuum, but we can tune from uh, uh, plus uh, minus one angstrom to plus one angstrom on this line profile. So here I will uh, I show you one of the 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 images which we uh, reconstructed by uh, which we obtained uh, from uh, tuning the calcium. I think I just show. Uh, uh, one filter. So. Uh, this is the, the wavelength point on, on which we tune the in the filter. So you can very nicely reproduce the 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 line prof, calcium line profile, not the, the full line profile, but the the core and then uh, the profile which is good enough to calculate the line of sight velocities. So this uh, kind of uh, calcium images can be used uh, at combined with uh, other observations. So I just uh, show you an example because we have a very precise. Uh, time information, uh, uh, which is given by the GPS of the the, the uh, tracking GPS of the telescope. So this can be easily combined with uh, other observations and uh, the other uh, from any ground-based or space-based observations, and uh, can be kind of studied along with other uh, uh, photospheric or any other wavelength. So, for example, here we showed the same region in HMI. Uh, the cropped in HMI, uh, the magnetogram, uh, uh, the, the continuum magnetogram, and the line of set velocities. So this is the calcium uh, 8542 line center, and this uh, at the 
uh, I think the blue wing of the, the, the calcium line. So here I just show you one of the on another example uh, uh, another example. So this is the HMI LOS velocity which shows you the reversion effect very clearly. But uh, in this case, actually, this is okay. This image is produced from the the uh, the previous uh, the, uh, the similar to the previous uh, data set where you clearly see. So what the, what I used here is a, a bisector method to reduce the the velocities. So here, what you clearly see is the inverse ever shed effect at the starting from the boundaries of boundary of the the perimeter. So uh, I just wanted to show this um, few examples where we can clearly use this data for uh, studying the chromospheric and photospheric coupling. Actually, sorry. So we also have a polarimeter installed uh, with the telescope. This polarimetry is based on uh, two liquid crystal uh, variable retarders. So you have uh, a voltage tunable uh, variable retarders where uh, by uh, appropriately applying voltage to the, the liquid crystal variable retarders, uh, in combination with a linear polarizer, you can uh, uh, obtain all the Stokes parameters uh, from the measurements. So here, uh, one of the the combination is listed here. So you have uh, four measurements, and you can uh, obtain I, Q, U, V, and U, U and V from these four measurements uh, clearly. I will show you one of the examples. So this is basically the Stokes parameters can be, or the Stokes profiles can be used for retrieving the magnetic field uh, strength. So I will ju just show you one of the examples here. So this is a uh, Stokes V measurement uh, compared with uh, HMI. Uh, magnetogram. This uh, HMI linear set magnetogram can be compared with kind of approximately roughly compared with the uh, uh, Stokes V uh, signal. So this is the the mass Stokes V signal for the same region obtained uh, with the, the polarimeter. So this is uh, uh, basically you can see the these are little bit blurred because of the the atmospheric seeing. And this is actually uh, around 20 30 images averaged for. Uh, uh, each wavelength position uh, um, for uh, each uh, polarization state. So now to, so this polarimeter uh, is sitting on uh, uh, in the uh, the in, in the back end instrument uh, floor, where uh, you have almost like around uh, I think eight mirrors before uh, the the polarimeter uh, through which the light has to pass. So you introduce a lot of uh, instrumental polarization because of that. Now, what we are planning is we are planning to put the polarimeter just after the the secondary mirror, so that we can avoid uh, uh, several deflections. Uh, in this case, actually, it's only so we are putting the polarimeter just after the M2, so that we have only two reflections uh, here from the primary and the secondary. So we already start kind of install the, the polarimeter here, and now we are kind of testing this uh, combination. Only problem with this is actually when we want to use the beam for uh, AO system, uh, since we have a switching between uh, different polarization states, that may not work for the AO system. So we have to kind of uh, really think how to come uh, out of that problem. And also we have a calibration unit just sitting in front of the, the um, liquid crystal variable tolder, uh, polarimeter. So this will definitely avoid a lot of uh, instrumental polarization and different polarization modeling uh, coming from the, all these oblique reflections. So another uh, instrument, as I told you, uh, installed by uh, URC uh, Bangalore, uh, basically Shankar uh, and his team, is a multi-slit spectrograph. Uh, this spectrograph is having around five slits, uh, which Basically, reduces the, uh, the scanning time of the the regions uh, to almost like uh, reduces by five times actually. So, uh, when we scan the the region, so this is I think six three zero two lines uh, in both. Uh, so uh, okay, what uh, this does is actually you have a polarizing beam splitter here. Uh, not sorry, the beam displacer beam displacer here. So from this, what you get is you get uh, two beams on the CCD. So these are the 
uh, two beams on the CCD, which is polarized uh, orthogonally. Like for example, this is left circular polarization and right circular polarization at uh, uh, means in a, the same time. So you have uh, uh, five similar uh, sets. So from this, what you can do is you can uh, uh, directly get the Stokes V or IQ and Q signals from uh, kind of subtracting these two uh, sections. So this basically reduces the scan time and uh, gives you a better uh, spectral uh, uh, purity. By scanning the, the image, you can always get the, reconstruct the, the 3D, so the spatial spectral and uh, wavelength uh, uh, images. So I'll come to the, the last uh, session. So the, the present capabilities I'm just listing here. So we can uh, have a regular narrow band, high resolution observation in the Chalfa and G band at present. And uh, we ha can have simultaneous 6173 images in 6173 nanometer and uh, calcium 842 lines. So these are basically originated in uh, protosphere and uh, chromosphere. So this can be used for uh, studying the photospheric and chromospheric dynamics. And uh, now the adaptive optics is being integrated uh, with uh, these instruments uh, and uh, can be used for uh, kind of uh, seeing corrected uh, observations. So, uh, so, and also we have, we can get observations from multi -spect spectrograph or spectral altimetry in uh, 6302 nanometer lines. So, the next step is to have uh, uh, instrumental, so integration of the and validation of the IO with a uh, narrow band imager, which is being done. I think last week we had some uh, observation with the uh, IO integrated uh, to the uh, narrow band imager. And then uh, we also plan to have a, so as I told you earlier, the, uh, the, the present IO system is 37 activities. Uh, but, uh, now we have a, a monomorph mirror, which is having around 90, 98 or 96 activities. So this, can, this is being tested and will be uh, used in place of the, the current uh, AO, AO mirror, deformal mirror. So this is characterization of this monomorph mirror is carried out. And uh, next step is to characterize and removing the instrumental polarization. As I said, since we moved the, the polarimeter after the secondary mirror, so we could reduce a lot of instrumental polarization in, introduced by the, the other uh, six or seven mirrors. But still, we need to characterize uh, the, the other uh, two mirrors for polarization. So we are uh, uh, in the process of doing that. So we started doing that now in, since we started doing that when the, the polarimeter was in the, the uh, observing floor. Now, since we changed the polarimeter to the, the telescope uh, structure, so we have to still again how to do, do the, the calibrations. And also we plan to, so we already procured uh, two ferroelectric liquid crystals, which so the, the main, the, the one and kind of uh, the big problem with the liquid crystal variable today is actually the switching time of the LCBRs are uh, like on the order of 22 milliseconds. So you have to wait 22 milliseconds after switching the LCVR before we take an image. So in the case of ferroelectric liquid crystals, the switching time is in uh, microseconds. So you can have uh, very fast uh, image acquisition by using the ferroelectric liquid crystal so that actually you can freeze the, the, so the C. So we are, we hardly have uh, two of these ferroelectric liquid crystal and we are trying to uh, characterize and then uh, use this ferroelectric liquid crystal uh, for uh, the polarimetric. So that's all. So, so we can, of course, since you know the telescope and the, the instruments now, you can kind of welcome to have joined the uh, observing proposals. Thanks. Thank you, Shibu. Uh, questions? Yeah. So, uh, nice to see your calcium 8542 Doppler gram. Uh -huh. Just wondering, what's the cadence you have if you have managed a So now, actually, I'm, uh, okay, uh, the, these images are, when we are taking this image, this was around, uh, uh, so this, the, the, if you see the number of points on the line power, like this, this image is sampled uh, in uh, 20 milliangstrom steps, which is not required, actually. Mm. So now, this, this for making this image, it took around two minutes, okay. Now, we are reducing the, so the main problem is actually the, uh, when we change the voltage of the February pero, so you can't uh, 
uh, do it very rapid, kind of very, very fast. So you have to wait for some time before we change to the next voltage. So that was on uh, problem. So we are trying to reduce that problem. Now I think in 45 seconds, uh, you can get a set of image uh, sampled in around uh, 40 milliangstrom wavelength chips. So that is the kind of thing which we are kind of coming down. So maybe we, we still may be able to reduce it, but uh, we are kind of at present like it's 45 seconds it takes to sample with a 40 milliangstrom wavelength chip, which sometimes you don't need that kind of uh, sampling. So we can reduce the sampling. Other questions? How was the resolving power of the all PSP The solar power, yeah. I think Shankar will tell. He is the man who put it there. So. No, uh, I think he's asking the spectral uh, resolution. Spectral resolution. Oh, okay. So it's, it's the order of. Uh, uh, so the resolving power measured is about 30 milliangstrom. 20 milliangstrom, yeah. That's so it's about at 6,000. 60, yeah. So it'll be about uh, 200,000 is the resolving power. Yeah. So we also have another spectrograph which we use for uh, testing the our instruments that also have similar kind of uh, solving power, but it's not a multi slit. So we can kind of in principle uh, use that uh, instrument also for uh, observations. Polarization, uh, uh, the polarimeter is for only one wavelength, right? Yeah, one wave. No, we have LCBRs for the the second. The the big problem with the the the, the polarization measurement is because when you go to calcium images, those are really structured images. Okay, so if you don't have a seeing correction, that can produce a kind of lot of spurious signals. Actually, even in the case of uh, six one seven three, also when you go to high resolution, if you don't have image stabilization system. Then that can produce a lot of uh, because you are switching the LCBRs and taking images in uh, at two different instants. So the seeing uh, will come and then uh, kind of play a role and yeah, then uh, kind of uh, yeah uh, the, the the granules, intergranular lanes and granules can produce a lot of uh, spurious uh, signals. So in uh, calcium we have uh, LCBRs but we will be testing it once we uh, integrate the adaptive optic system we will be testing the. So we already characterized the LCVS. So we have the LCVS for uh, calcium. So we will try to, uh, but first we want to kind of use these images to get the velocities and. Uh, right. Okay. So um, thank you once more, Shibu. Yeah. Very nice talk. So the next, and this is the last talk of this session, uh, will be by Giulio Delzana, uh, unveiling the mysteries of the solar corona and the wind. By uh, with the solar orbiter and dekist. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try to be short because I want to have a tea break. First thing I'd like to say is thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And as the topic is huge and I only have 25 minutes, so this will be my personal selection. However, I have to say I had a lot of contributions in terms of slides from lots of people, which I haven't had time to write all down because it's actually a lot of people. And um, <clears throat> uh, what else I wanted to say? Oh, yes, I wanted to say also thank you to the Royal Society. I'm here because. Uh, we have a collaboration uh, with uh, PRL Group that built the solar X-ray monitor on Chandrayaan 2. And so the Royal Society has paid for my flight to come to India. It's, uh, it's always very nice to come here. And, uh, and I was here two years ago already. So um, my main focus is on these three science topics. How and where is the solar wind accelerated? How are CME accelerated? And basically, what is the corona magnetic field, which is the underlying problem, as we all know. So we really need, in, in principle, uh, we need observations of the plasma characteristics and the magnetic field in the outer corona, especially in the region here, about one solar radii above the solar surface, where many of the closed structures become open, 
and into forming the solar wind. We had excellent overviews from Sarah Gibson and other people about these issues. And this is the most interesting region and the most unexplored region, actually. <laughs> um, so this, um, these science questions basically are very linked to the main uh, two, uh, first two science questions from Solar Orbiter. You can see them here. Uh, it's basically the same sort of questions. And then there are other two questions related with energetic particles and the solar dynamo, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, mostly because number four will come later on. And because, again, I don't have much time, uh, we should be uh, lucky enough to see launch on this coming Sunday if uh, we don't have another delay. We already had many delays. Um, the mission is an ESA M class with strong participation from, from NASA. OK, so uh, this is an overview. Uh, it's a huge uh, satellite with in situ instruments measuring all sorts of um, uh, particle distributions and uh, the solar wind and energetic particles, magnetic field in situ. And I'm not going to talk again about these in situ measurements, although they are really the primary measurements. I'm mostly going to talk about the remote sensing instruments, this one here, which are just behind this uh, shield, this thick shield, which has to basically try and protect them. Um, and these are the, the main instruments, which you, you see them here on this side of the spacecraft. Now, many of the instrument papers are available now on open access. Not all of them, unfortunately. So I encourage you to read the details about the instruments, as I will flash some of the details, but you won't have time to digest all this. Um, OK, uh, the operations. Uh, we have a cruise phase of about 1.8 years. Um, we should have a commissioning phase lasting until June when we will do all sorts of calibrations. Then we have a period uh, during the cruise phase where about uh, three times when the instruments will be switched on, the remote sensing instruments, but mostly during the cruise phase the remote sensing instrument will be switched off, while the in-situ instruments will be operated regularly. Uh, once we get close to the sun, then we have uh, uh, three remote sensing windows. The main one is around perihelium. <clears throat> and the data is stored on board up to six months, although continuous low latency data will be available. And in general, the data, once we get them on the ground, uh, the instruments teams uh, signed a contract with ESA, which is something I really liked, that they are obliged to release the data to the whole public within three months, which is something very nice. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the main point I want to make about all this, which is uh, extremely complicated, is that solar orbit is not a solar mission. Is a basically um, a mission, a planetary mission, if you, if you like, in the sense that it's not, that is not a SOHO. It's not a, it's not a mission where you can basically decide what you want to observe. Everything has to be planned months in advance. The main instruments are the in situ instruments. The remote sensing instruments have been uh, they scoped, it basically, and provide uh, information uh, to, well, I will, I will explain, basically. But basically, they've been descoped so much that we've been talking about meter telescopes. I mean, the telescopes are one centimeter telescopes. Okay? So can you can imagine, we've been struggling to have enough photons to get images. Because we are very close to the sun. Otherwise, if the aperture is bigger, the instruments will just basically die. Okay? Um, if you want to get involved, you have to go into here. And there are these observing programs. If you Google solar orbiter, you don't find any information. There's very little information about the instruments and everything. But if you go to this website, you find basically information about the various observing programs that have been designed. And the whole community is welcome to participate. Uh, it's a highly elliptical orbit. It will get close to the sun at 0 0.3 astronomical unit with a period of 150 days. It's very, very challenging. We don't know how the instruments are going to behave. We have to see. Another main point I wanted to make is that uh, most of the solar orbiter in contest, so during perihelium, will be nearly in quadrature uh, in the, with the Earth-Sun direction. So this is the Earth, and this is the Sun. And these arcs, these red arcs, are basically the perihelium uh, passages. So this is an excellent opportunity to work in synergy with any instruments. And I list some of them here, but there is a huge list, as we've seen already, of instruments either on ground-based or basically on L1, like Aditya. 
that can actually provide information on the off-limb corona of the plasma that will be observed in situ after some time by solar orbit. This is really, really important. We can't miss this opportunity. Of course, there is also Parker Solar Probe, which, I, again, I don't have time to talk about. has been mentioned already. So we're really into a good position to make progress about all sorts of things. But we need synergy. So um, these are the instruments so in terms of the imaging. Uh, these are three, three images. Um, sorry, Oof, too fast. Uh, this is a tricky thing. All right, going back. Back. I don't understand why I did this. Sorry. OK. So the, the UV imager has basically three telescopes. One is the full sun in a coronal band, iron 10, and in a chromospheric band, helium 2. And uh, then we have uh, high resolution imaging in the hydrogen Lyman alpha, and uh, again in the same uh, coronal band, iron 10. These are the three telescopes. Uh, the very interesting thing will be, well, the interesting things will be two. One will be that the full resolution image will have a very large field of view. So we'll see this region, which, uh, as, as I mentioned, is really important, uh, the outer region of the corona. And the high resolution imaging will provide images at high resolution in the corona, similar to a high C, and uh, in Lyman alpha, similar to volt. Now, we did have these wonderful images, a high resolution from, uh, um, from the Sandy rockets, which only lasted five minutes. And originally, we were very excited about the possibility to have regular observations with this sort of resolution. However, the telemetry on an average orbit is such that uh, for each orbit, we'll be able to have only five minutes of this high resolution <laughs> data. So when people ask me, oh, can we do wave study? Can we do this and that? It's with solar orbit. I said, forget it. Uh, solar orbit, most of the observation will be seen optic in coordination with the in situ instruments. Occasionally, we'll be able to do these high cadence, high resolution studies, but not for every orbit. Having said that, the telemetry varies dramatically. So there will be periods when we will have a lot more telemetry when the spacecraft is closer to the Earth. So there will be a lot of uh, flexibility but the flexibility brings in complications as well. Uh, now, the solar fees are basically uh, will provide, it has two instruments. It's a full sun and a high resolution partial frame uh, magnetometer, which provide magnetic field of the full sun and typically of the size of an active region. You see here typical products. Um, they, 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 they basically, the original uh, data, the spectra, will not download it as in many other of the other instruments, the byproducts will be downloaded from the instrument to reduce the amount of data. Um, OK, this is the spectrometer. Very complex uh, instrument uh, with, a, with a slit. Uh, we'll be able to scan basically the size of an active region in two wavelength bands where there are plenty of spectral line, mostly formed in the transition region. We will only be able to observe the few of the strongest lines because of the signal again. And the model of operation is extremely complicated because uh, the instrument is very flexible. It lets you do all sorts of things. Um, these are slides about the field of view. So when we are close to perihelium, uh, the, the, the imaging telescopes and the spectrometer will have uh, uh, field of view, which, as I said, is about the size of, uh, of, um, of an active region. While if you are around 1 AU, basically the field of view of the high resolution image will be almost the whole sun. On the other hand, the full sun uh, images uh, will have a relatively large field of view. But when you are far away from the sun, you have a huge uh, field of view. Uh, we also have uh, an imaging spectrometer called STIX. And these are the details about this instrument. We provide uh, information about high energy events on the sun, solar flares, for example. We also have a coronagraph called METIS, which is externally occulted. It has two bands, one in the visible light, uh, producing polarized brightness, and a narrow band in the hydrogen Lyman alpha. The spatial resolution will vary depending on the instruments and the mode, but it's typically around 20 to 40 seconds. 
And the cadence, again, it depends, but typically around a minute or so. And again, depending on the distance, the field of view, the annular field of view of the coronagraph will change. And we provide, as I said, polarized brightness, global maps of the Lyman alpha, the electron density from the polarized brightness, and some, uh, but depending on the models and how the solar wind behaves, but some information of the outflow velocity through Doppler dimming techniques in some regions. Here's an example. It's not a spectrometer, so it's an imaging instrument. So it's one of the many instruments, well, all the instruments in solar orbit were scoped. So original plan was to have a spectrometer, but we only have an image. So this is the field of view of the other instrument, which will be having a huge uh, field of view, the solo high. It's similar to the stereo in the visible light. So you will, you will see a wonderful combination of UV imaging of the outer corona here, then a bigger field of view from the Methis coronagraph, and then an even bigger field of view from Solo High. So what are we going to do with all these instruments? Well, the overall idea is to measure with the remote sensing instruments uh, uh, like SPICE, for example, temperature densities and chemical abundances. Then we feel the magnetic field, then we magnetic field extrapolation, trying to link the source region with the in situ data. In the in situ, we measure the charge states, we measure the chemical composition, the wind temperature, and, uh, and the velocity. And what we really want to do is to say, OK, we measure this wind. Where is it coming from? This is what is very difficult for Parker Solar Probe. In principle, with Solar Orbiter, we want to try and do it. But it's going to be very, very complicated, very difficult. My view is that if we have a corona hole, it will be relatively easy. If, we, if it's just quiet sound, it will be very difficult. If we have active regions, I think we are in a good position because we had a PhD student. She came from here, actually, at UCA. She published a paper where she showed that uh, many active regions have jets coming from sunspots. And most, all, almost all of them have type 3 emission, which confirms what we already knew, um, which is that uh, these uh, jets basically are open into the heliosphere, so basically are you know, a good link uh, in terms of uh, source region of the, the plasma that is, is, is coming from, from low down from the sun to the heliosphere. Uh, in terms of the spectral lines from uh, SPICE, uh, this is just an example. There are many more. So these are basically the emissivity calculated with our own atomic database called Chianti, which was started by Helen Mason, who's here. And, uh, if, if you look at this, uh, it's a function of temperature. There are some combinations of lines, for example, from argon and iron. As these are my favorite. Uh, one is uh, high FIP, one is low FIP. So in principle, you can measure the relative abundances. However, there are three problems the way I see it. One problem is that we have to improve the modeling of these lines. The second one is we have to understand uh, basically, the, the chemical pattern on the sun of these lines, which is not very clear. Uh, so that's a big problem, because how can you then relate in situ if you don't even understand the pattern on the sun? And then the other big problem is that most of this emission at these temperatures is coming from closed structures. All these beautiful images of the sun in the UV are showing you these closed loops. OK, they are closed but somehow they're going to have to open to release, at some point somewhere, plasma into the heliosphere in the solar wind, right? So how do we do it? Um, so the first topic we are trying to address, I have a student. This is a very preliminary work published on carbon. So this is the, the carbon ion charge state distributions. Uh, the blue line is the low density, basically, is what you have in the Chianti database. And the red line is the typical uh, quiet sun density in the transition region. Uh, the black line is the, at, at the density of, uh, say, a solar flare. And you can immediately see, for example, if you look at carbon-3, that you think carbon-3 is formed at some temperatures, but actually carbon-3 is formed at temperatures typically factor of 2 to 3 lower. Carbon-4 is even worse. It's not only a temperature difference, but the, the charge state increase and the intensity of carbon-4 increases by almost a factor of 3. And this is just putting just a little bit of physics. I mean, it's taken us two years of work. 
but and we're still putting in photonization and adding stuff. So these are big effects, and all the transition region emission lines from iris from any instrument are affected by this. So this is a big, big problem, big issue we need to address. Or anyway, people need to be aware of. How long do I have? Ten minutes. Okay. So this is a crash course on solar abundances in one slide. I invite you to read, if you can manage to get to the end of these 300 pages review, which took two years to write uh, by me and Helen. There is a whole, the final section is on element abundances, and there are preconstituted uh, uh, ideas which date back to Skylab, which turn out to be incorrect. Um, my view, but actually is the view which is coming up in this various literature by many other people, is that if you look at uh, lower transition uh, region emission up to a million degree, you have a wonderful example here on the left. If you look at the region loops, uh, it's a mess. Some of them show photospheric abundances, some show very abnormal abundances, coronal, and, uh, and we don't know. The quiet sun, I think, now there is a recent paper also from George Doshek, who in the abstract, he's, he put down my surname, which has never happened in the past, saying that I was right in pointing out that the quiet sun is nearly photospheric, so that I was pleased that he, he came on my side. While, you know, it's, it's, it's typically taught in the community that the, the, the solar corona at one million degree should have coronal abundances. No, it's not. The solar corona has photospheric abundances. If you look at higher temperature emission plasma, everybody agrees, and the scalar results, uh, you know, we're mostly okay. That uh, active region at three, around three million degrees show about uh, enhanced abundances. Corona holes, everybody agrees, is around photospheric abundances. The quiet sun is a big mystery. So how do you, all, as I mentioned, how do you close and open um, these loops? So this is one possibility. There can be many others. Uh, this is just some references from my papers, but there are other papers from other groups which came with similar conclusions. We actually provided a physical interpretation and a model. Uh, the others provided the idea, uh, but I think many people agree, also in the literature, the interchange reconnection is a possible good way. So basically you have closed magnetic field structures in the active regions which expand as the active regions grow. They interact with the surrounding magnetic field which very often happens to be pretty much unipolar, and then you can have high up uh, around one solar radii above uh, the solar surface, interchange the connection, which releases plasma into the solar wind. Um, finally, the last uh, few minutes, I want to talk about Dickist. Again, I could talk about this for hours. Uh, I won't. Uh, you know it's a four meter, you know, wonderful, you saw the wonderful first light. The main point is that it really has low scatter light. So, and I went there two years ago, and I witnessed the sky is really, really amazing. So, I think we'll have to, the option, the possibility, very soon to have regular corona physics, which we never had. Regular corona physics was done in the 1930s by Bernard Lyot, and never after, unfortunately. But now we are in some surprises, hopefully. Uh, it's a very complex system with adaptive optics. These are, there is a rotating, uh, um, basically, bench with lots of instruments here. Only some of the instruments can operate simultaneously. This is a list of them. Each instrument, you can spend hours and hours and hours to try and understand how they work uh, because they're very flexible. I'm just going to mention uh, the cryonisp because this is the main instrument designed to observe in the near infrared uh, the solar corona. The API is Jeff Kuhn. And basically, we we'll work by scanning with various slits uh, a region of, of about this size. The main lines are these ones, the RN13 lines, which were discovered by Bernard Leo, the helium one, which is still a mystery, and then about another two coronal lines. We'll be measuring coronal densities, non-thermal widths, temperature, coronal magnetic field. And I've told them when they get some money, I wish I had some money to give them to buy some filters to actually measure chemical abundances. Um, the, the amazing thing is that the, the near infrared region has never been observed. Um, so I wrote a review paper uh, two years ago 
And this is a sample uh, from one micron to three microns of the continuum of some of the lines based on the Chianti atomic data, which uh, actually provided most of the scattering data for these transitions. Um, and these are the famous iron 13 lines. Um, you only have corona lines here, but most of these lines have never been observed. Amazing. And the best observation on the ground is this one during a solar eclipse. You see these iron 13 lines, the helium one, strong. And then the silicon 10, 1.4 microns, which is one of the main targets for this instrument. And what you, can you do with this? Well, again, you should go and read uh, our review. If you had the chance, uh, in the review, we discuss a little bit the density analysis with RN13, the fact that the lines are strongly photo excited, which brings in a, model, a problem in the sense you really need to model the photo excitation of the lines. This is non-trivial. Many people don't understand, unfortunately. But in principle, once you model that, and you have a range of spectral lines, you can measure temperatures. But this is what I'm really interested in. In principle, the instrument can observe all sorts of lines uh, from the higher temperatures from different elements. And so in the future, we should be able to measure the relative abundances at this sort of temperature. At the moment, we, we can only do it with you know, the ice. Finally, I wanted to mention the helium one, because as you've seen here before, Going back, yeah, there's a strong transition here. And uh, there, is a, there is plenty of literature where people have discussed what is going on, if this is a corona line or not. And I, I spent eight solid months working even Saturday and Sunday with various people to try and build a model of the helium line in the corona, and I haven't quite finished. Uh, but I realized how things are really complicated. Um, so finally, just a mention of a pathway to this near infrared. And uh, the CFA group um, managed to get funding, uh, about a million dollars. They gave it to this bright PhD student, Jenna Samra. This is the instrument on the bench. And they've flown it twice on board of an aircraft uh, during two eclipses in 2017 and 19. There are wonderful observations of these near infrared lines. Some of them were observed for the first time. <clears throat> Some of them will not be observable by Dickies because of the atmospheric absorption. This is just an example, one result from this paper where uh, they confirmed, uh, we confirmed, um, that what I predicted was, was right in the sense I told them, you, look, if you observe the quiet corona, you typically go and observe uh, an isothermal plasma. These are emission measure loci curves. So if these curves intersect, they give you the temperature. And I also told them, look, you're probably going to see photospheric abundances. They said, no, no, no. Well, they put the data on, and this is sulfur. So sulfur has photospheric abundances. And um, yeah, amazing. So we'll be able to do these sort of things regularly with, uh, with Dickist. I don't need to say anything. I prepared this because I wasn't sure when I was going to talk. Uh, I didn't look at the program carefully. But you've seen how wonderful VLC is going to be. It's going to be really, really helping solar orbiter. And also, you've already seen Proba3, again, will be really helping, like VLC, to you know, observe the outer corona. So I'm finished. And, uh, but before I actually finish, this is a movie of the solar orbiter launch. You have the Earth and Venus and Mercury. So these are all the various flybys of Solar Orbiter. And why this movie is going, I wanted to say that uh, we managed to get a grant uh, from the local councils. To, so we will be advertising a postdoc position uh, within the next few weeks, hopefully, to work on Dickies and Solar Orbiter. So if you have any uh, PhD students uh, basically finished, or if you know someone who could be interested, uh, they should get in touch with, uh, with me, and uh, thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> Questions? Everybody wants to go for tea. <laughs> so I, I have a naive question. So, so um, you, you mentioned 
at least a couple of times yeah. how the abundance in the corona is really photospheric. Yes. So can you elaborate? I mean, I, I really know nothing about the, the sphere. I mean, as in, mm. why is this a surprise? Or, uh, well, because the literature until recently was saying the opposite. Uh -huh. In the literature, everybody, well, most of the people in the community have this idea that the abundances are corona. So the, the iron. So there's no such thing as a coronal abundance? What are you saying? No. I mean, okay. No, the coronal abundances, uh, the, the solar corona has photospheric abundances which is shocking to most people. So what does at, that mean? At about a million degree. At least ah. this is the, this is the, all the, 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 the confusion aro arose uh, when uh, one of the key papers was from Martin Lamy in 95, where he took uh, the best spectrum. And uh, again, I'm sad to say that the best spectrum, the solar corona was taken in 1969. But it was a full sun spectrum and it had strong active region components. And actually, some of the active regions were even flaring. They saw iron 18 emission. So what he did, he did an emission measure analysis, and he described in the paper that up to a million degree, the abundances were photospheric, but above a million degree, the abundances were coronal. So iron was enhanced by a factor of four, OK? So and all the other results, in general, uh, from the community sort of agree with that, OK? Now, the problem is that. Um, I've revisited the observations, and I've taken full sun irradiant spectra from, from the STOE spectrometer in the UV, and I've shown that actually if you look at the quiet sun when there is no active vision, the abundances are photospheric, up to a million degree. Above a million degree, you can't say anything because there is not enough signal, okay? That's why I had a question mark. Above a million degree, the, the abundances could be corona, but I don't think we have firm evidence, I mean 100% sure evidence that the abundances are corona. So I didn't say that the abundances are not corona above a million degree. But the other thing that people have to get in their mind is that the abundances vary dramatically depending on the features. And maybe some people have been saying that they vary with time as well. So the whole thing is, is kind of complicated. So when you have active region, if you take the full sun, then the active regions contribute a lot to the emission, well, contribute almost 99% to the emission above a million degree. And then we know, because we have spatially resolved observations from Scala, from you name, from Soho, from you know the eyes, from everybody agrees that the abundances are increased, that they are corona, about a factor of four. So that's fine. Uh, but the quiescence sort of solar corona is not very clear what abundances it has. So yeah. I hope uh, that clarified a little bit this complicated uh, issue. <laughs> A brief comment and a question. I think you are courageous to say that Solar Orbiter is not a science mission. You are not in the one of the PIs, so <laughs> you are safe probably. I am a Kauai, <laughs> I am a Kauai, but, but uh, I, we went to the Solar but I, I wonder, you know, if, if there is a good observing programs and uh, dedicated programs. Yeah. I mean, this is a discovery mission. I mean, it has yeah. all, all kinds of capabilities. Yeah. So in that context, I was saying in the data, uh, pipeline development and also in terms of the observation. Yes. Aren't the detectors also able to detect part of the uh, chip? Because as you said, the telemetry restriction, yes. you know, is reducing your total data volume, what you can collect. But as we have shown in the previous thing, even in Aditya, we are planning to only detect a part of the chip. So if you have, uh, you know, different uh, spatial scales, because as you go closer to the sun, you have much higher uh, spatial resolution and so on, your plate scales are changing. So if you want to only observe a part of the, you know, your field of view, your cadence can be improved. I don't know how is it uh, not, I mean, is the capability there with the detectors or not? The cadence for the spectrometer is more or less okay, because we will only observe a few key spectral lines. Yeah. But the problem I mentioned is for the image. Yeah. You want to have the, you know, the you know, quarter or tenth of an hour second resolution imaging data, less than one second re resolution cadence. Uh, yeah, but when you're looking very far away from the sun, most part of your field of view is not usable. Your, your uh, you know, disk portion is much more limited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can't you read part of the disk only? Yeah, yeah, of course you can. Then your uh, cadence can be improved. Yeah, but then the, the spatial resolution will not be of as course, high. As of course, of course. Spatial yeah. resolution will be different yeah, yeah. because your plate scale is changing. Yeah. as you are in the different uh, locations. No, there is no doubt that there will be a lot of science uh, coming up. I think it, I it's wanted to make the point that, you know, this is an encounter mission. It's a basically a planetary mission. It's not 
a science mission that you can call the PI and say, oh, can you upset that active region yeah. in, in two days yeah, or in yeah. a week? Yeah. No, no. That's not possible. It will yeah. be decided six months in advance. We yeah. will be observing this and that. Most of the observations will be done at Sun Center. Yeah, so that's why it is more important to have the observing program, you know, as you said, the soaps are yes. uh, known to the community yes. and the observing windows which you have so that you can coordinate with other uh, space and ground-based uh, stations. So yes. these things will be very important. I guess yes. next one and a half years will be spent for that. Yeah, we, we have time. We have, uh, we have almost two years, yes, to, to refine these uh, programs. And we are eagerly waiting for the instruments to switch on to see how they, how they behave because they've been built ages ago, and uh, we have to see how they, they, they perform. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you add uh, some words about your own point of view uh, on the mechanism of uh, uh, coronal loops opening? Uh, what is the main reason, uh, your model? Oh, the main reason is just in yes. magnetic reconnection. Yeah. We, what we did we, was very simple. We did some nonlinear force free extrapolations, pretty global, of active regions which are isolated on the sun and embedded in a pretty much unipolar um, region, which is, was common in 2007. And then it turned out there were null points, of about one solar radii above the solar surface. And if you have an null point, that would be the place where you can have magnetic reconnection. So then we said, well, maybe this could be happening, and this could explain how the loops can be opened up. And then we did some hydrodynamic modeling. This was all done to explain something else, which I didn't have time to explain, which is these coronal outflows from active regions. But uh, basically, this could be a way to, to open and it's one of the favorite mechanism. I mean, uh, uh, how else would you open a closed magnetic field? Um, if you have a flare or something disrupting it, but magnetic reconnection is probably the, the most obvious thing that happens. Can I just, can I just, is that on? Yeah, yeah. can I just add to that? Um, quite often when we have an active region, as we see with Hinode ice, we have an open region next to it, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a small coronal hole or an open region. And uh, what we're finding is that these active regions, the closed loops, are then reconnecting with the open loop loops, as Julia said, this interchange reconnection. But we're also finding this with jet work that Saga Muli has been doing, is yeah. that uh, on, the, on the edge of the um, sunspots, um, you're finding that the, the uh, closed loops are interacting with the <coughs> open fields and producing these active region jets. So, I mean, nobody can, uh, yeah, nobody can argue against that. I mean, the jets are obviously going into the heliosphere, and they always come from near the sunspots. So that's, again, an indication that uh, there, there is an open field associated with sunspots into the heliosphere. I am not saying, which is what a lot of people got confused about, that the active regions produce the solar wind because the solar wind is there anyway, as Parker said. You know, if you have a two million degree plasma, you're gonna, you're gonna have the solar wind anyway, even without active regions. So it's, not, it's an additional thing, and, and it would be like a lighthouse helping solar orbiter to see things, because otherwise you'll see solar wind, and if you want to connect the magnetic field line, uh, the topology of the magnetic field is very complicated. It has a lot of current sheets and uh, quasi-separative surfaces. It's very complicated. Um, so it's been difficult to do this connection. Um, there is a modeling working group that is trying to do this, develop these models. If people are willing to contribute to that, uh, they're more than welcome. We need these models. Because otherwise, as uh, was mentioned by Sarah, we have the community in situ that will do their own things, the remote sensing community will do their own things, and then will not do the real science which is needed, <laughs> which is to combine this. Um, all right. well, the last thing is that I have some outreach stuff about solar orbit if people want to take it here. Yeah. Thank you. Very well. 
So, well, that brings us to the end of this session. Let's take a minute to thank all our speakers. And uh, Durgesh has some announcements to make. for this evening. Um, we'll be going to um, coffee break now and after that we'll have a public talk from 5.30 to 6.30. At 6.30 there will be buses outside um, so people are going to, I mean all of us are going to Marriott. Uh, people who are staying at Marriott they should use uh, the cars which should have a level of JW Marriott written and uh, people is staying at uh, Hotel uh, Duck and Rendezvous. There will be a bus for them, so with that level, so please use that bus. And there will be other buses for uh, people coming from ISER, who are staying at ISER, and people is staying at Ayuka. So all the buses will be just when you go out of the auditorium, they will be all there, so please get in. Um, our reception should start, Depending on the traffic, it's not very far away. It's only four and a half kilometers, but depending on the traffic, it can take anywhere between 10 minutes and, and an hour. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a uh, it's, uh, Monday evening, so uh, everybody has worked really hard, so they will be trying to push, and you know there will be a lot of honking on the way. But the buses are, the drivers are safe. They will take you nicely there. Um, the reception should start any time between 7 and 7.30, so you reach there and you'll have an ID card anyway, so they will direct you uh, that where to go. So let's break now. Uh, there should be coffee, uh, tea, and some cakes, if, I, if I'm right. Hopefully there will be. Um, and then there are about 90 posters, so I urge you all to go and spend time on posters. And mostly they are from, from our graduate students uh, from all over place so it's nice for them to interact with you on their posters so I invite you to go there and, and have a look at them. Thank you.
Halo. Halo cek. Halo, halo, halo. Halo. Halo, halo cek. Halo. Halo, halo, halo cek. Halo, halo Mike cek. Halo. <laughs>